All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to uh, Fire Rush's Story Time on Fire Rush Reborn, the channel. Mm. Flame book, Cyclord one, buy it if you haven't got it already. Uh, okay, so. Uh, I'm not feeling great just now. I should just make that clear. That, you know, a lot of my videos are quite sort of bouncy and funny and uh, zany or whatever. But I just feel a bit like crap. Mine is not the worst I've ever felt, but I just feel a bit kind of sad, a bit lonely, a bit hollow. You know? Like, what the hell is the point of it all? Uh, and part of it is like, I've lived through so much now. As my story has been showing. Uh, and I'm just feeling like... Uh, heavy, I suppose. Weighed down. Like, what's the point of it in a way? And I know that tomorrow I'll wake up and I'll be like fine because I'm just a bit tired and I've had. I've been doing these videos voluntarily, you know, I'm not blaming anyone, but I've been doing these videos um, for a while now and we're getting into some pretty tough stuff. About me being homeless and potentially, um, well, no, let's just say I was sexually uh, abused, I suppose. I mean, it's hard to really know, actually, what whether it counts as abuse or not. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, yeah, so it's just getting a bit kind of heavy, you know. It's, just, it's a bit dark and a bit weighed down. Um <clears throat> And also my normal life now is not really normal either. So it's just, uh, I go through phases where I'm like, fuck this, you know, I don't know why I bother. I don't know why I bother writing these books, you know. I think sometimes I feel like, I feel like my life is an inspiration to others. And then other times I feel like, well, you know, what's the fucking point? If I don't feel good about my life and myself, then how am I? I'm not really inspiring anyone else, so. Uh, and I don't like the feeling of trying to inspire people when I'm not feeling like inspired myself, basically. So, yeah. I mean, like I just cancelled a gig earlier on today because I don't feel up to it. I don't want to do any more gigs. You know, I've had a load of bad experiences with gigs and guitar and singing and guitar and stuff. And one of the things that <clears throat> I find most distressing about gigs or any performance of any kind is the lead up to it like my i hate the waiting for it and i hate the anticipation and i hate the deciding because there's uh there was a period where i used to do open mic nights down in windsor every week on a thursday and then i was doing other open mic nights elsewhere as well and it was getting to the point where it was always the decision to make a conflicted decision to make whether I would actually do it or not and if I went there whether I'd go up on stage or not and it was all kind of like it was partly to do with my ego like whether I uh I don't know no it wasn't no it wasn't really to do with my ego it was to do with do I want to put myself through a horrible experience tonight or not basically do I want to put myself up on stage for no pay in front of a load of people who may or may not be listening and who may or may not care and who may or may not be positive towards me culminating in the point where i just got some really rude people um insulting me from the audience at one point during a really awful night where everyone was rowdy and drunk and uh, I just had enough of it, and I walked off stage um, midway through a song. I just put the guitar down. It's just like I don't need to do this, you know. I don't need to sit here and be insulted uh, from stage. You know, there's a point where being gracious just why, why, why bother? You know, if people have just got an issue that they're trying to vent their issue at you, that's got nothing to do with me, really. I don't need to 
I don't need to go through that. You know, I don't need to put myself through that. I'm not being paid. I wasn't being paid for that. Uh, so it's just like, why should I get up on stage in order to be humiliated or to be held a held abuse at? So I thought, fuck this. And actually, it turned out that the organisers shortly after that event just stopped doing the gig because I don't think they enjoyed playing the venue that much. Uh, anyway, yeah, so I just cancelled the gig tonight because the reason why is I'd had it booked for a while and it had come through my dad as well and I'm never, I just don't like my dad messing around and trying to like help my career because it always feels like I'm being pushed into something I don't want to do. Uh, yeah. Like he always kind of tries to help me in some way and it's always some kind of feeling like I just don't want your input. If I'm going to organise a gig, I'll organise it myself. I just don't want you... There's always some feeling that of expectation that if I say, if it comes through him, then I, like, if I want to do it or don't want to do it, I have to pass that through him somehow as well. Like, so he's got some extra control over me and extra expectation on me. It just puts extra pressure on me. And I'm like, I didn't want to do the gig. The closer it was coming to the gig, and it's, it's a month away. but And it was booked about a month ago. And the closer it's getting to the gig, I'm just like, I just don't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. The nearer it gets, the firmer I get in the feeling of I just don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't even know why anymore. I just don't want to do it. I'm like digging my heels in, like, just don't want to do it. And it would have been paid 50 quid. I don't know how long it would have been to play for. Half an hour, an hour, I guess, an hour max supporting two other acts that I don't think I really fit in with to be fair one guy's just doing violin and the other guy's doing the guitar and I don't know if they're a duo or what but it just I don't know I, uh, it's just all wrong something's just wrong about it you know and the last time I played any I did anything in that particular venue was a stand-up comedy gig that I did years and years ago and I completely and utterly bombed it was the worst gig I'd ever done no one no one laughed. Like it was just the worst gig I'd ever done, um, and so I guess I don't have fond memories of doing things there. And I don't like Eton either. Generally speaking, I think the people there are snobbish and disinterested and uh, closed-minded. And it's just like I don't, I don't want to be there. Um, yeah, and I quit another gig um, <clears throat> for similar reasons of pressure. And, you know, this is not really about other people. This is about me and my issues, <laughs> my feelings about things. Um, that, you know, other people can go and do their gigs and be paid 50 quid for half an hour or an hour of work. And that's great for them. And that's, like, awesome. Like, if they're playing their original music, that would be, like, what they wanted. And in a way, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be paid for my own music. But there's this other part of me that is, it's nothing to do with ego. It's just to do with being emotionally bruised from lots of bad experiences um, of t terrible gigs. And just, I, I hate the feeling of, um, it feels stressful. It feels stressful. You know, it's not a fun experience anymore for me playing live. Uh, not at the moment anyway. Um, it's just fraught with feedback issues that I, I cannot handle it at the moment I cannot handle uh, I don't know I don't feel like I can prepare for a gig either at the moment I just feel like it's too pressurizing um the whole like potential of making mistakes as well or forgetting my lyrics and stuff like that I mean I just can't deal with the weight of other people's expectations on me at this point in time. You know, I feel it in here. It's like well, something tight in me that's just <sighs> finds it really difficult. And I never used to be like this. I used to love gigs. Okay, get a little bit kind of nervous about going on stage to begin with. Like just not stage fright, but a little um, excitement, agitation, whatever beforehand. But it was never anything major, you know, nothing I could really nothing that would want me to stop playing because the thrill of playing live was amazing but i guess i've just had so many shitty experiences both live um in front of audiences and also just busking on the street which is another whole big thing uh 
where you know you're open to the elements i got freezing cold on many occasions and uh, but i felt like i was so poor that i had to do it so it's just like you know i don't know what the fuck so i'd actually i made a promise to myself that i was going to not do any more gigs do like all right all right let me try and set the scene a bit more so there's an open mic um on a thursday in winter at a different place now and I used to quite. I used to have this discussion internally with myself every week, pretty much, whether I would go to the open mic night or not, right? And that whole discussion in my head would begin probably like on the Monday, and it would start in my head, and I would think about it for a while, and I'd be like, okay, maybe I'll go this week. How do I feel? Um, you know, do I feel like it's the right time to go now? Am I recovered from the last one? Have I processed all the stuff that happened last time? Did they did did they enjoy it last time? Did I enjoy it last time? What the hell was the point of that? Have I come to terms with you know the last experience? Because I guess this might sound really really strange, but it feels like each one of these events, if I don't go into it feeling good, then I'm just going to come out of it feeling even worse than I did to begin with. So there's no point in me like rupturing my emotions anymore by going in not feeling great and then being beaten like by some aspect of the audience not paying attention or being rowdy or throwing an insult or some uh, thing I can't control um, happening and I'm not being paid for it anyway. So like, what the hell? You know, it's just like... Something has really, really freaked me about doing gigs. Something's really knocked me confidence wise. And it's not even that, it's just I don't enjoy the kinds of audiences that these places have. Um, and maybe it's just because I've been subjected to the either completely disinterested, snobby, or aggressive and rowdy audiences of Windsor for so long and Windsor and Eton that I just I fucking hate it <laughs> I fucking hate it yeah and it's made me hate what I feel I was born to do which is to play guitar and sing and write songs and make music and I feel like the scene the open mic scene in my area has made me fucking hate what I do hmm yeah, so I was saying about this open mic night thing. This would happen on the previous open mic night as well. I'd have this discussion, am I going to go or not? You know, Do I want to put myself through this? I'm not being paid. I would like to make a success out of this. I'd like to be paid. I'd like this to go somewhere. And no, nothing ever came of it. You know. Um, and then I would get disinterested crowds or indifferent crowds. And I'd feel like I was the one putting the crowd off because I was the only one who wasn't playing covers. And everyone else was playing covers that people could get along with and sing to because of a fucking bunch of drunken dicks and they don't have a... <laughs> their minds are not open to listening to new music most of the time, so it's just a pile of shit. Ugh. And, uh, yeah, so I just feel it's just a real fucking self-esteem knocker, you know? Like, it's not great to see everyone else play covers and a crowd enjoying it and then i go up there and play my own songs which i spent however long writing and developing my fucking craft to be able to write good songs and to be able to play well and sing well and to put my fucking heart and passion and soul into the playing of the song live and to be in a, in a peak state of presence and uh integrity with how i'm playing and what i'm playing and feeling like it's falling on death deaf ears or shitty fucking ears and it just felt like, why am I doing this? Like a thankless task kind of thing. It's a payless task and a thankless task and a, an abusive self-abuse. It was turning into self-abuse. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I actually doing this? And then other open mic nights as well, like go to places where there's like no one even there. Or hardly anyone shows up. And it's like, why, why do I have to do this? I don't have to do this anymore, you know. Uh, maybe to begin with, I was getting some kind of buzz out of the approval of an audience. And then then I just stopped getting approval from audiences. And I just got maybe a little bit of approval, maybe mainly, mainly indifference or sometimes the abuse, as I was saying. And it's like, well, I'm not getting any approval. I'm not really enjoying the experience. So why am I doing this? I, 
I know I've decided to do this with my life and this is like my passion, but if my passion is meeting with a reception of bollocks, then I don't feel passionate about <laughs> encountering bullshit. All right, that's not part of the passion, so fuck it. Anyway, yeah, so I'd have this argument with myself in my head, like, shall I go or not? And if I do go, shall I play or not? Because another aspect of it as well was I felt like I was always, if I was to go to an open mic night, to enjoy an open mic night for as a listener and as an audience member, the people who run these things, they're very pressuring. Like if you go there to actually just, I just want to be, I just want to spectate. And they fucking had pressured me at different times. People were, have been very pressuring um, to get you to play. And I, you know, there's a certain point where you think, yes, I do play a musical instrument, but sometimes I just want to be in the audience and I want to enjoy myself and not have to play. I'm not being paid. All right. Nothing good is going to come out of this gig for me, by the way. This is not going to lead on to anything else. This is not going to lead on to a paid gig because I play my own original material and you venues do not put on gigs for original material. So I'm not going to get a gig. So why do you want me to play? You know, and it was very like one sided. So I had pressure from people always asking me if I'm going to play and maybe it's because they think that I was good or something huh I don't know but even so I still want to have the dignity to be able to say I just don't want to play tonight and for that to be accepted you know I actually want to enjoy the night as an audience member I want to I want to not be working if that makes sense for no pay by the way So it just really made the whole experience of playing live into a fuck fest of shit. Where I felt degraded and I felt a lack of enjoyment and a lack of positivity and just a pressure. So I would have this discussion, am I going to go? Because, you know, I want this to go somewhere. This is what I've always done and what I've always wanted to do. And now my belief in myself was being a no one's caring and no one's listening and no one likes it i'm sure some people did like it but the majority just didn't give a shit basically and uh, it was real hard times and similarly lately i was having that same internal discussion about whether i should go to this other open mic night or not because the guy who runs it is a decent guy he's a friendly guy you know i've known him for a long time and there's nothing wrong with him he's a, he's a decent bloke um you know and so in a way i feel like yeah i w would like to go in a sense but then then there's these memories and are people going to like it or not? And it's just been so tainted by all the previous experience. I just don't feel like I've recovered from all that previous stuff. Um, so I've been very, very sporadic in my playing live. I haven't busked for years now because the last times I was busking, I just got so much grief from the street. There's this, there was these fucking, <laughs> pardon my expression, but these divvy kids, just pricks, basically, just fucking pricks trying to play my guitar and like... People were always coming up to me and saying I should go on X Factor. And it's just like, c can you just not come up into my face while I'm playing and like stand this close to me? Can you fucking respect me and like get out of my face? And then I played in Oxford as well. And I got a bunch of drunken dicks kind of crowding around me while I was playing in Oxford. And it's just so intimidating, you know? It's like, it's almost like I feel like, um, Let's say, for example, I don't play the song that they want me to play because I don't know it. And they get, like, angry at me or pissed off at me. It's just very unsafe feeling, the whole thing. Uh, fuck it. I hate it. It's fucked. It's a real negative feeling. Oh. And it's always been a bit like that busking, you know. It's very unpredictable. You never know what who's going to show up and what they're going to ask and how it's going to go down and it has been the case that it's been friendly uh, in the past a lot of it's been friendly and i have made good contacts in terms of meeting people i've even had sex with one person two people uh who i met via busking and probably more than that now if i 
if I try and think hard. So it was good. It was good in some ways, busking, eh? You know, there's a sense of community and people get to know you and stuff like this. But then there's the other side of it, which is people get to know you. So if you go to that town, then everyone fucking knows you or a lot of people know you. So you can't go anywhere without being recognised. It's like a mini... I'm not getting ahead of myself. It's like a mini feeling of fame. It's like, I cannot walk in this town without all these people who've seen me busking, who are like regular townspeople, picking up on me and knowing me and at least recognise me and want to say hi. And it's just, ah, that drove me insane. So I stopped doing that, (laughs) busking, because, oh, Jesus Christ. It's just... It, it drove me insane the fact that I couldn't go anywhere just and be anonymous and just like I just want to go somewhere and not have someone talk to me I just want to go somewhere and just do my thing and to not be a regular so and it's all like it's all self imposed really isn't it it's, these are all self choices i've made i've made the i made the choice to go busking and then i made the choice to stop so it's not like i'm blaming the world and maybe it sounds like i'm blaming the world maybe i am blaming the world a bit but uh i, I guess i'm blaming the world i wish that i wish that i could do what it is in my heart to do the passionate things that i want to do and have them succeed <laughs> And all right, I don't mind a few niggly bad things every now and again because that's life. But it just feels like there's so many uh, shitty things that have happened. Um, and it's like, why is it that the, I, the things I choose to do come up against so much resistance from other people? Uh, like as though the world just wants me to do what everyone else is doing and not do what I want to do. Fuck. Anyway, so the discussion <laughs> would come every week. It'd start about on Monday as to whether or not I was going to do this open mic night on a Thursday. And that's just something that I just did not want to have anymore. I did not want to be thinking, shall I go? Am I going to have to practice? How how well do I feel like my music is going at the moment? Am I going to remember my lyrics? How, you know, what songs am I going to play? Because there's all this kind of strategizing as well. It's not just, it's kind of like, you got to have your songs to play. And how many songs am I going to get? So I have to practice more songs than um, than necessary, just in case they ask me to do more. Because these open mics are very variable as well. Like, I've gone to open mic nights sometimes where they've made me play, like, eight songs because hardly any musicians showed up. And <laughs> that, oh, that was okay that time. But I'm not... I'm not at a professional level, so I may be able to play somewhat professionally and sing somewhat professionally to to that high sort of level, but I don't do it as my constant day by day living job, which I would love to if it wasn't fraught with difficulty <laughs> and if I was actually able to be paid for what I do in the way that I do it, the way that I want to do it, that I could be paid reasonably well, like £150 for... I think, honestly, because of my mental scarring about it, I probably feel like maybe £100 an hour is about enough to make me feel okay about doing a gig. So partly maybe doing this most recent offering was like 50 quid. I was like, do you know what? 50 quid's 50 quid. And there's not that much. And you can't actually buy my emotion uh my emotionality with 50 pounds you know i would i yeah fuck it i don't care it's only 50 quid kind of thing someone else might say well that's 50 quid that you could use for this that and the i don't care all right i don't care my happiness comes first you know fuck you fuck 50 quid and like fuck 50 quid i don't fucking care right <laughs> i just don't i don't care seriously if it's going to make me stressed in the lead up it's going to make me unhappy thinking about it beforehand if, if it's going to just send my head into a spin tailspin whatever and it's going to make my emotions go up and down in anticipation and then trying to calm myself and and uh, practicing and the feeling of pressure you know (laughs) just fuck (laughs) man so let me finish the point that i keep coming back to and i haven't quite finished it yet so the discussion will come every week and uh, i got to a certain point i'd 
been sporadically doing open mic nights here and there recently over the last six months or so just doing one every now and again and drinking too much as well after them and beforehand it's just i don't i don't even know what i'm doing you know <laughs> normally i wouldn't drink before playing a gig and i found myself drinking before playing a gig and i'm like what, what am i doing you know what, what what's going on i shouldn't be doing this this is not right this is not how i work this is this is fucked and i yeah Ugh. so um the discussion in my head about whether or not to do the gig and the planning aspect as well you know the getting the songs together and then the practicing of the songs and remembering of lyrics and you know what which ones should i do or should i do new ones should i do old ones what, blah, 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 and try and make it into something that works and how many should i do and sometimes you go there to an open mic for example and you only get to play two songs because there are loads of musicians so it's like well i practiced for eight because the last fucking time no one was there so i needed eight songs so i practiced for eight which was stressy and annoying um, <laughs> to do. <laughs> and now I'm only playing two songs. So what the fuck is this? Why am I here? What is this? Uh, so basically, the long and the short of it is, I decided after a while, it was about like a month ago or so, that's it, fuck this, no more gigs until after 2019. And I'm even thinking now, no more gigs until 2020. Fuck it, I don't care, I need time off, you know. I obviously, my uh, fucking emotions are fucked from gigs of any kind, whether it's open mic nights, busking, any live performance, whatever, you know. I realise I haven't played my guitar for ages, and in a way I'm happy that I haven't played my guitar in ages, because it feels like the whole feeling of playing guitar at the moment is still tinged with this aspect of performance for other people who may or may not like it, who definitely most of the time aren't going to pay me, um, I just feel like it's a real self-esteem basher to play the guitar at the moment. Um, plus my songwriting, I'm like a bit, I'm, I'm okay with my songwriting actually. My songwriting is not bad at the moment, but, um, starting to feel a bit samey as well. So I'm just like, mm. if you overdo songwriting, then you can just fall into a trap of being like unoriginal and just plowing out the same chords in the same sort of way and singing and playing in the same sort of way and never never feeling like fresh anymore so I'm okay with leaving it for a while you know I know that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lose it forever kind of thing because it's something that's so deep about um, so deep about me uh yeah so uh okay so I decided fuck fuck gigs and performances of all kinds and i'm doing other things anyway i'm doing like my videos i'm doing my books what else do i do there's something else i do but i can't remember artworks sorry yeah right there uh lots of artworks in the making in the background that i uh, should probably do some more work on actually yeah so i've got other things to do eh and it's just like, it's just a stress that I don't need right now. And because it still feels stressful, I decided that's it. No more until 2019. And now I'm thinking, fuck it for like the whole of next year as well. Fuck it off. Just, just fuck it off. You know, I bailed on a gig for my dad um, earlier on in the summer um, that I'd arranged. And then I said, no, do you know what? I can't. I don't want to do it. I just, it's blowing my mind preparing for it. And I don't want to do it. I just don't want to stress and I don't want to have to deal with people coming up to me and saying I'm great or not saying anything or or I just don't want to do it. Yeah, you know? I just fucking need the rest because I feel like gigs are something that hounds me. And I just want to be able to fuck it off and just say no, just fucking leave me alone, please, now. I'll just leave me alone and no one's like forcing me but this is something that's developed inside me you know no one's forcing me to do this from the outside at all this is just what has happened in my feelings and my feelings have just developed this kind of real negativity about doing gigs uh at the moment and it's been there for a while and uh this one that was scheduled to go on in september uh has just really got me in a twizzle again <laughs> and 
There you go. So this is why I've cancelled this most recent one. It's because uh, I'd made that decision to not do any more gigs uh, until like 2019. That's what that's what the decision I'd made at that time. And then this phone call comes in like <laughs> two days later or something from my dad saying like, oh, do you remember that? gig that I was saying about might happen at this time uh, from this from these bunch of people um, at this event and I was like uh, mm, yeah and he said well do you want to do it and I was like well no <laughs> um, not unless I'm being paid and then it turned out that yeah, I could be paid for it 50 quid right and uh, and I felt like I was being forced into it by my dad because he he was quite not overly but he was insistent or he really wanted me to do it for whatever reason and I think that maybe my dad feels like he's gonna look bad if I don't do these things that he's like sort of said that I'm a good musician or I'm some some kind of singer songwriter musician guy and he wants to get me gigs and then it looks bad on him if I don't do it but fuck that I don't care whether it looks bad on you because you're trying to help me out and I don't want to be helped by you I'm sorry it's just, you you're not considering how I actually feel about these things you know I don't enjoy them at the moment so why would I want to go out and put myself through some miserable experience <laughs> For the benefit of who? I don't care. You know? Fuck that. Uh, yeah, so internally, you know, I literally just made this decision. I want to I wanna relieve the tension and this argument in my head, this discussion as to whether or not I'm going to do a gig or whether I'm not going to go busking or not as well, which was coming up again. You know, I just don't want to... I want to, like, make a decision to fuck it off for a while so that I don't have this coming in my brain and my mind every week. You know, I want to just free off that energy and say, this is a decision. Fuck no. Just fucking leave it because I do not want to have that decision playing on my mind. Let's fuck it off until... Um, 2019 right and uh and then and then i got this call from my dad offering this gig and i was kind of thinking i've just made this decision not to do the gigs and now i feel like i'm stepping outside of what i feel is right for me by saying yes to this gig and i shouldn't have said yes to the gig because really and truly i should have just said dad I'm sorry, but I've made a decision to not do any gigs until 2019 because I just feel like I want to rest from it, you know, and it, it's it's causing me a bit of a emotional upset and turmoil and it's not making me happy to do gigs at the moment, so I just want to leave it. And I should have said something along those lines, maybe a little less about it, but, you know, a bit more neutral and calm. But obviously I couldn't do that because I didn't feel calm. I felt annoyed. <laughs> So, yeah, so I said, I just said yes, and then I kicked myself afterwards, like, ah, man, I shouldn't have said yes, because i just completely gone gone against my own integrity as to, I look, I know that this is right for me to not do these gigs anymore for a while. You know, I, I know that this is something that is a positive step for me. It might sound negative because I'm not doing something and I, I feel bad about it, whatever, but it's a positive step because it's setting a boundary and it's setting a decision to not stress myself out and that's positive it frees up energy so i feel like i am relieved okay i feel relieved by that decision like okay i've decided i'm not doing anything until like after 2019 so it gives me a fucking rest so i don't have to have that stupid discussion in my head every week about whether or not i'm going to do a gig of any kind you know, because it's just settled. It's like, that's it. It's not happening until 2019. And I would just say no to anything that comes in because I don't want to do it. And I don't care if it ruins my fucking reputation to not fucking do gigs. I don't care. I don't care. I just need you to leave me alone. I just need this time to just not do that because it stresses me the fuck out. Right? And it, when I get to a point where it no longer stresses me out because I've had a nice rest from it and I don't haven't been, you know... <laughs> thinking about it so much and getting into a twizzle around it <laughs> like ooh, shall i no oh the, the, the bad experience blah, blah all that stuff when i've had a rest from it and my emotions are like back down to normal and neutral and and i feel good again then fine i'll crack on 
But at the moment, it's just like, no, just leave me alone. You're like the fucking cow prodding thing. And I just don't want to be prodded anymore with it. Just fuck off with the cow prodding thing. You know? Uh, I think that explains it, why I feel like shit right now. <laughs> or why I did feel like shit anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, is that it? I think that's it. Just fuck them off. Don't have to make a decision. So I cancelled the gig just earlier on today. And I feel better. I feel better already. And I just I just know, but it might not be, but I just feel strongly that my dad is going to step in and say, Whoa, why have you cancelled the gig? And I'll be like, oh, bleh. I may not just, just not reply. I may just, I can't deal with this right now. Like, I, I don't want anyone. Just get out of my face. Right, I cancelled the gig, I did it very, like, nicely, and then she was like, oh no, how come, and I just, I, I don't want to, I don't want to have to explain myself either, okay, I just, I just need a break from it. And that's something else that annoys me, is like, you try and cancel something and people want to know why. And the reason why is an hour long video, and I don't want to give you the fucking reason why, okay. I just want to give you the reason why, because if I was to write the reason why, oh, how come? Because, fucking massive essay to explain why, you know, with <laughs> my views about life and stuff in there as well. It's just like, duh, no, it's not appropriate for me to tell you why, I'm afraid. You're just going to have to fucking accept it that I'm not going to do you a gig, and I'm sorry. All right, I've given you enough time to find someone else, so fucking deal with it. Um, I'm probably sounding like a complete and total arsehole right now, but I just... Uh, people forcing or trying to force you or coerce you into doing anything is just it fucking winds me up. And I've I've honestly got to the point where I feel like I don't have to justify my decisions to anyone anymore. Because at the end of the day. I'm just not going to show up to your gig, <laughs> you know, I, that's it, you deal with it. I've given you a month to fucking find someone else, it's easy, there's loads of people, it's fine. Uh, so, you know, even if someone, no one can actually force me to do anything, because I, if they, even if I arrange it, I will just not show up. I remember this one guy, this is a completely random, different story, but it's on the same sort of theme, this one guy <laughs> was doing this business networking thing, uh, like the, I was going to a lot of business networking groups to try and promote my guitar teaching business, yeah. And there was this one guy who was a very pushy sales, salesy type person. He was running a sales and marketing course, I think, of some kind, like some some like marketing material, like a, some course that he was trying to, sorry, get people to come along to, to learn about how to market their business correctly. It was, it was this kind of club thing. Where it was a kind of teaching thing about how to run your small business and market it effectively and effectively and stuff like this. And those things, right, they're of a fucking crock of shit. Just never go to them. Okay. Because it's bollocks, basically. It's just a way for uh, people to get money from you by delivering you content that you could read in a book about that thick most of the time so that's just a random side point but anyway he he had like a, we were having a conversation about so he was trying to get me to come along to this event uh, like a learning event thing whatever and and he said something like so can I put you down for for it and I said well I don't know maybe we'll see and he said right I'll put you down for it then Okay, and I didn't show up because I hadn't said yes and I didn't actually want to go to it. And then the next time I saw him in another like networking event, he goes, oh, I was disappointed that you didn't show up. You know, I'd put you down for it. And I was like, well, you didn't actually listen. I didn't actually say I was going to go. <laughs> you know, you pushy fucking dick. Fuck's sake, I'm really angry. I've been watching The Dark Crystal tonight. And it's just full of these bird things. And they're so creepy. And everything's so... The whole fucking film is made of anger. 
I feel like that angry, that everything's fucking, that dog is angry. That, um, Ogre, whatever, and Ogre is fucking angry. The bird things, the Skegsies is are angry. Everything's fucking angry in that film. <laughs> it's just winding me up. Maybe that's where this has come from. I shouldn't just, shouldn't have watched that. Oh. <laughs> but then at the same time, I feel like the film is quite important because if it's triggering me to this extent, then I need to watch it again and I need to like, I need to kind of process what it's saying. Obviously, it's a very dark film and in a way that's good because if it's managing to reach inside me to trigger some stuff that I wasn't aware of, then that's a good thing. And I appreciate that kind of film, um, even though I don't enjoy it necessarily. It can be that I will later on enjoy it because it's like a it's a challenge. It's a it's an emotional challenge to get through and to deal with <laughs> this fucking gross bird things and the little dog, little like, ah, everything is all like, ah, oh my lord, it's so loud, so loud and abrasive. Everything's so fucking loud and abrasive in the film. So that's probably why I'm so angry. Plus, I just got this gig stuff that's just happened. And I'm just like that. That's it. Fuck this, man. You know, I just want to trash the whole room. Ugh. So, hmm. and now, um, you know, this video is supposed to be about fucking becoming homeless in America and kind of being. No, it was, I was uh, sexually uh, um, assaulted. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Well, yeah, while my mind's on the, on the topic, and since I'm already in a rage, then <laughs> let's talk about this being uh all right so i'm not going to give you the ins and outs of it because honestly i cannot give them to you because i can't remember them clearly enough as to how and why this happened but i was in the um port authority bus terminal uh i feel like i was homeless at that time um i guess that i was kicked out of the hostel by that point and i was still floating around in new york yeah so as i was staying floating around in the port authority bus terminal um and Let's just go with this particular chunk of the story that I'm going to have to um, bring out other parts at later dates. But there's this one particular part I can tell quite clearly. So I was waiting there. I was just hanging around. Um, and I was just like watching people come out of the train station thing. So people come off the auto metro, whatever you fucking thing call it. Metro auto? Subway. They come out of the subway, off the train and subway yeah they come off the subway and they were just like off their way going on their way home and i was just like i don't know why i was sat, sat there maybe i was thinking help me help me kind of thing help me help me maybe someone here is going to help me i don't know if i was begging or what maybe i was begging maybe i had like a little hat out i don't think i had a hat out i don't know what i was doing i was just sat there watching people and basically pleading in a way inside myself like please someone fucking help me okay I'm, I'm homeless and i don't know what the fuck to do so i just guess i thought i'd sit there watch these people come by and maybe someone would take pity on me and help me and someone did uh it was a older businessman guy so i guess he was like 45 maybe 50 tops Now, I was pretty naive at that point. I was in a pretty innocent state of mind, as in, like, I trusted everyone implicitly. I mean, I told you in the last video that I trusted some homeless guys with my guitar, or guitars, I can't remember. And obviously, when I came back from the toilet, they ran off with my guitar, which... And uh, you know what? Honestly, I thought when they'd run off with my guitar, I thought I hadn't trusted them enough because I'd, in the moment that I let them have the guitar to look after, I felt a flicker of doubt in my head about whether or not I should trust these twonks with my guitar. And I actually genuinely felt like it was because I doubted them that that doubt played out in reality. Whether or not that, whether or not that's true, I highly doubt it. I think they would have nicked that whether I trusted them completely or not. <sighs> yeah, so anyway, so I was in the Port Authority bus terminal, like waiting and kind of sat there like, help me, help me, please. I wasn't saying that help me, help me, but I was making that kind of impression, I suppose, because I felt that way. I was like, oh, please help me. 
And so this business guy comes out. I remember it quite clearly. He came out from the left-hand side. Well, now I say that, I feel like he might have come from the right. There was a left, left-hand thing and a right-hand thing, and I feel like he came from the left. Anyway, so he came over. And he he said something like, uh, "Are you okay? Do you want to lift lift home or lift back or something?" And I said, "Yeah, please." Or it might have even been he said something like, "Do you want a place to stay?" And you know, if you're listening to this story, you can obviously see where this is going. This is not going to end in a good good place. <laughs> but me in that situation, I was 21 years old. I was in a very innocent state of mind as I say like I was in a very kind of trusting and open state and so I didn't really see other people's negative intentions or bad intentions I just I just couldn't see them somehow I just didn't like couldn't understand why people would ever be bad for some reason like I trusted all kinds of people and it was getting me into all sorts of stupid trouble because I was trusting all kinds of bad people to be good to be nice and kind and genuine and open-hearted and warm and giving and stuff and people were being assholes uh yeah so i said please yeah i know i said yeah let's go Let, yeah i would love that because you know i need someone to stay because i'm homeless at the moment and without even considering the fact that it may lead to some kind of sexual thing, you know, I didn't even t- contemplate that as a as a factor, which is obviously ridiculously naive. But that's just where I was. I, mean, I can't really make an account for that, other than that's just where I was in my life at that time. Not not noticing those kinds of things. Uh, and I had no sexual intention myself with it either. I don't think I even had any intentions of anything other than just to get a, a warm bed, right? And I was very, very open and very, very trusting and just going with the flow big time, not suspecting anyone had any negative intentions towards me. So, uh, I thought this was great. I thought, yeah. He's gonna off, like let me stay at his house um, and give me a lift home, whatever. And then that's that's nice. That's that's good. So I got in the car, um, like a cab, which he paid for, and he took me back to his place, right? Which was I don't know, I don't know how far it was to be fair. It was in New York still, and. Uh, Got back to his place. He was telling me he was having some building works going on in the place. It was a nice apartment, you know. Uh, he had some book, uh, like a shelf of books, which were kind of into spirituality, which was nice from my perspective. I was into spirituality, obviously. Um, and he'd said that I, I looked like a spirit child of some kind. I may well have been wearing my bright, golden dress thing as well so that was probably why he felt I looked like some kind of spirit child (laughs) and I guess I was a spirit child in that sense that I was just totally free of any concern at all about anything apart from like needing food and warmth and somewhere to stay but other than that I was just kind of going with everything and complete and total faith and trust most of the time anyway that things would work out somehow and that I would survive and it would be okay. Trust in the universe completely just surrendered. Yeah, so I got to his house and he like pointed to various bits of the house that weren't completely um, good yet. I didn't really see that there was anything much wrong with it, to be fair. Um, And he had like the spiral staircase thing going up to this other part. I don't even remember where the bedroom was exactly. But I remember being in the kitchen. I remember him offering me a beer. And I said yes and I had a beer. I think I said yes and had a beer. I can't remember. Do you know? I, th- I feel like I had a beer there. Um, it was like a Heineken. No, it was a uh, Bex. I think it was a Bex. I remember a green bowl. Um, so I think I had a Bex there. Which was fine. Uh, feeling a little bit kind of 
uncertain by this point though because I was in a different okay let's this set the scene I was miles away from my family I was in a strange city I didn't know anyone I'd been kicked out of my hostel I was homeless <laughs> had no fucking money you know I was by myself um, I'm now in a strange person's house that's lots of that's lots of uncertainty right there and lots of fucking scary shit I can't believe I'm still here anyway so I was there had the Bex he told me about some of these books on his bookshelf and I thought, oh yeah, I think one of them was The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which is a book I haven't actually read, but I've actually seen that recently. Uh, it's on the front cover of another book I've got because it's by the same author and I randomly saw it in the mind, body, spirit section of the bookshop that I went to in Staines the other day and I was like, ah, The Peaceful Warrior. And it's just remembering it now that that was one of the books that he had a, he had on the shelf in this place. I can't remember his name. This old guy, not old, 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 but older than I was. 45, I reckon he was. Between 45 and 50, yeah. Fat guy as well. Big, big fat belly. Uh, I think he wore glasses. Not that you're ever going to find him, right? But, um, yeah, so, so we're in the kitchen and he was just talking about whatever, I don't know. We're having a conversation. And then somehow it led to me going into the bedroom or us going into the bedroom, right? And he was like, you you can sleep on this side and I'll sleep on this side. It's a double bed. I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. That's not why I was... That's not why I was... Um, expecting I didn't think it was going to be that kind of scenario I thought that maybe I don't know it was a spare room or a single bed or something and I could sleep on I don't know the floor or some camper bed or something but no um again it would have been fine if if I knew what was going on <laughs> to begin with and that that and I known that that was the deal, and that that's what I was going in for. And presume like maybe he presumed that that's that I did know that that's where it was going. Maybe because I uh, like didn't necessarily have my uh, I was quite sexually um, ambiguous. If that's that the right word, um, andro not androgynous, but like it wasn't clear whether I was gay or straight or what. I was kind of quite fluid in how I manifested in terms of my sexuality. So it was like someone could have easily thought I was straight or easily thought I was gay. So it it just wasn't clear. So I could have appeared as obviously gay or obviously straight, depending on who was, who I was talking to. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess that he thought maybe I was looking for that. Maybe I was looking for a night. Maybe I was looking to hook up with some old business guy <laughs> You know, maybe he even thought that I was some kind of uh, hooker. Or whatever. Or maybe he just thought that I was some kind of young guy out out for a night of fun with a, with an older guy. And that's why I was sat there. Maybe that was what he was reading into the situation. And that was not my intention. Fucking hell not. I mean, I was just a homeless guy trying to get someone to stay that was warm and out of the fucking cold and wet and rain and all the other scary bastards in the world. Hmm. Okay, so I reluctantly got into the bed with him. Um, which was not a nice experience at all because this big, fat, old, smelly guy who'd had a beer. And uh, nothing happened uh, initially. Thank fuck. Nothing happened, um, and I managed to go to sleep even though I was sat like lying in the bed, like, oh, oh god, what the hell? Um, this is not how I was supposed to be. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a single bed, and now I'm trapped in this fucking house with this fucking weird guy who's picked me up, and you know, 
uh, what the hell, and I shouldn't be in a bed next to him, and why am I in a bed next to this guy? Um, like, how do I get out of here in a way? But there's nowhere else to go at the moment either, so at least it's fucking warm in here, that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, and uh, let's call him Frank. I don't know what his real name was. I can't remember it now. Let's say Frank. I mean, he was a nice enough guy in a way, and maybe it was just he thought that I was down for it, and I wasn't down for it at all. Um, and so, if you're squeamish, this is the part to not watch. <laughs> so skip past the next five or so minutes. Uh, so, this is your last warning. This gets gross now. All right, so um, I wake up with uh, this fat, old, smelly man kissing me. On my lips. And it tastes disgusting. It tastes like acid. Like, the, you know, the worst combination of alcohols in one mouth it just tasted disgusting. And the breath and this big, fat, gross, ugly. He wasn't attractive. He was just a fucking gross, ugly, fat, stinky, older, gay businessman kissing me and it's disgusting to think of it but there there it was and um also um i'm not sure whether he was playing with my dick or he was putting my hand he was certainly putting my hand on his dick which was disgusting as well it was a very small dick as well uh. And I was not happy about that at all. Um, he might have been trying to play with my dick as well. And it was just the most gross sexual experience I've ever had. And I, it's, maybe his name was Steve. I don't know. But Frank or Steve, whatever his name was, I just said to him, Steve, I'm going to call him Steve now. I said, to, I got to a point and I was just like, Steve, you've got to stop doing this. Like, this is not what I was here for. I did not want, I don't want this. I just want to go to bed. I just want to sleep. Like, you got to stop. And I got really, like, shirty with him, and rightfully so, because fuck that. Uh, and, like, I pushed him off me, like. And, uh,. And he did stop, to be fair, but it was just, it was horrendous. It was a horrible experience. Uh, I was so vulnerable and so taken advantage of. Um, and I just felt so invaded and I just was so angry at him for doing that. Uh... And at least he, he kind of rolled over and went back to sleep as almost as though nothing had happened. As in, like, maybe he didn't even remember it in the morning kind of thing. But I did. It was gross. I might have got off the bed and tried to sleep somewhere else, like on the floor or something. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So, that was gross. I mean, in a way, I'm glad that I had the strength to push him off me and kind of assert that boundary, but just the fact that it even happened, that I was completely clueless. I was completely and utterly clueless, and I had no consent to that whatsoever, that this guy had just forced himself on me while I was asleep, basically, and I'd woken up to have this happening to me. And, 
you know, if if it if it had been that that was the deal from the beginning and I was up for it or whatever and you know whatever the fucking thing that I was attracted to him or whatever if it was agreed and or even if it was tangentially on the cards that it might that it might have gone that way um, from my perspective then that would have been okay but it wasn't to that point it was no from my perspective no like feeling of wanting to to be with this person in any sexual way at all so it was completely forced and um inappropriate and not welcome and like uh, i was not happy with it and i had not consented to it and it was like uh, i was in a very vulnerable situation to have that happen to me so it was like unfair as well um mm. it's just nasty i think the taste was the worst part because it just tasted like acid grossness and i don't know what he was doing he was just doing something with putting my hand on his dick or something or trying to i don't know what he was like trying to get onto me in some way or other i don't know what it was like trying to like he was he was so oh. um I was on the right hand side of the bed and he was on the left hand side of the bed. That's just, that's how I can say it like that. So I was on the right hand side of the bed. He was on the left hand side of the bed. So I'm there. He's there. Right. And I wake up and he's like on my face with the kissing thing. Oh God. And then, and then, uh, and there's the willy thing. I don't know what, big fat belly and trying to, I feel like he's trying to get, over onto me or pull me onto him and like playing with my dick and he's trying to play with get me to play with his dick or something and I was I was like I was asleep when it started happening so it took me a while to realize even what the hell is going on I was like waking up in a bad dream and I was like what the hell what the hell um and I sort of came to my senses I was like what you know no you gotta stop this um this is not what i wanted this is not why i'm here and uh, i don't want you to carry on can you please stop get off me and i pushed him off and uh yeah oh god i don't think i've ever told this story in full detail like this before there are many things i've not shared on this whole journey yeah so so that happened. <sighs> I was thankful to have the night to stay somewhere that was warm, but I was not thankful to have this prick shove himself on me. So there you go. That was the uh, abusive thing. Maybe it's not as bad as some other people have had, but it was pretty fucking shit. So we'll leave it there, because that's a decent end point, isn't it? So there you go. That was something else that happened there. Um, sorry, this has been such a hard session. Um, it's just how I feel, and I can't really perk myself up just for your benefit. I'm sorry about that, but... Uh, this is how it is. This is, this is the truth. This is the story. This is what happened. This is how I feel. So, uh, thanks for sticking it out. If you've got this far, well done. That's been hard work. I know it's been hard for me. Um, I'm pretty sure this is not going to be easy listening for most people. So thanks for coming and for coming along the journey. And, uh, I do apologize if I've triggered you yourself. Um, yeah, but, uh, there we go. Uh, I will talk to you next time on Fire Ross Reborn, Fire Ross the Storytime. Bye.